Okay, so let us uh, start in a proper way that by thanking the organizers for inviting me to give this talk and also allowing me to just dash in and dash out, which is not something which I like to do. And the next important thing to do in the agenda is to turn this around, since I can't switch it off. <laughs> right, yeah, fine. So <clears throat> the title which I have put is, of course, the take on lectures which you would have heard so many times in the last year. People have all been talking about the first 100 years of VR. So I thought it would be nice to talk about the next 100 years of VR, which has to be very nicely interlinked with quantum gravity. And based on what we know in the first 20 years into this century, what is going to happen in the next 80 years? This is not good. <laughs> this is not what I had in mind. Ah, it's bad. Okay. Fine. So, the, if you go back and ask in the 20th century, what are the top two discoveries? If you do a poll, you will get different results, but my choice would be these two. We discovered that matter is discrete and it has microscopic degrees of freedom. This is a very new thing. And uh, previous centuries thought matter is continuous all along. We also found out that universe has dynamics and it is expanding. This is what I would vote as the top two discoveries of the 20th century. So let us go into 21st century. What is going to be the top two discoveries of the 21st century at the end of 21st century? I would conjecture it is going to be this. Just like matter, space-time is discrete and it has microscopic degrees of freedom. And instead of keep talking microscopic degrees of freedom of space-time, I will just say atoms of space. It's just a way of talking about microscopic degrees of freedom. We will also discover that the universe has its own dynamics and it should not be treated the way we are treating it today as a special solution to the equations of gravitational field, like G. So this is what I'm going to try to motivate and convince you during the talk. So since it has to do with GR and QG, let us start talking about three major challenges which we are facing today in GR. First is the singularity problem at the centers of the black holes, which uh, no approach to quantum gravity has been able to make any headway with. We do not know what happens there. And there's not a philosophical problem. It's a breakdown of predictability in physics. As John Wheeler used to emphasize, if you have a colleague whom you put at the top of a collapsing neutron star, and we all have one or two colleagues whom we want to do this, and when it collapses, the colleague asks you, what is going to happen when my watch shows such and such time? And you have to throw up your hands and say that I can Tell you what happens 20 minutes down the line, 30 minutes down the line, 37 minutes down the line. After that, I don't know. Which means predict physics cannot predict the future. This is serious. Then there are two more problems which all of us know of. One is the value of the cosmological constant. And then this is not exactly a problem but a puzzle. That there seems to be a very strange connection between thermodynamics and gravity which we don't, we are not very comfortable with. Where it comes from and whether there is a deeper reason for this, etc., we really do. All these challenges involve Hedgecock's. First of all, the uh, singularity problem, it is it's going to be resolved. Many people believe that it has to do with the uh, quantum of area, GH cross upon C cube, and that is where something interesting is going to happen. There is no cosmological constant problem in classical general relativity because you cannot form a dimensionless number with lambda, g, and c alone. But the moment you throw in hedge cross, you have a tiny number, and we don't know where it comes from. The, all the thermodynamic connections essentially come from something like the Andrew Davis effect, where there is a hedge cross which converts some acceleration into a gravity. So all of them involves uh, hedge cross. So we need a QG to completely understand this. So the, the question of the century, the previous century, was that how do we put together the principles of general relativity and quantum? Several people have tried this over decades, and many pro approaches seem to be very, very promising in the beginning, only to find that in the end, somewhere along the line, it gets stuck. So the question is, why is this happening? 
and what is going to happen in GR in the next 100 years, which is going to change. I believe we need yet another paradigm shift in our understanding of GR. And roughly speaking, it can be stated by this line, the equations governing classical gravity has the same conceptual status as those describing, say, fluid mechanics or elasticity. So there is an underlying atoms of space-time. In some quartz grain long wavelength limit, these equations arise, but these are not the fundamental equation. So from this, it is immediate that the usual approaches to quantum gravity will fail because it is like if you quantize the equations of elasticity, you'll get very beautiful quantum phenomena like scattering of phonons, transfer of energy between phonons and everything else, but you're not going to get the physics of the atom. So just like that, if you take the equations of uh, classical gravity or the Lagrangian of classical gravity, which is like describing the elasticity of space-time, and you go and uh, apply your quantum principles to the wrong end of the stick, so to speak, then you are going to get gravitons and a lot of physics associated with gravitons, but not the quantum, quantum structure of the space. So the paradigm which I want to talk about elaborates on this. Of course, when this idea was originally came up, a lot of people have worked on that. And I'm only going to concentrate on the work done by me and my collaborators in this talk. When this paradigm originally came up, uh, there weren't too many followers, but off late I find that everybody is talking about information, gravity, uh, you know, space-time is like a liquid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is a good sign. So people have caught on to the paradigm, but everybody has their own ways of implementing the paradigm. So I want to first describe to you how the approach which we have been pursuing is different from everything else. For example, there has been the approaches by Ted Jacobson and other people to derive uh, Einstein's equation from this thermodynamic approach. There were approaches from Wolowick and other people. So there are various approaches. So I want to give you three key ingredients which distinguishes the path which we have been pursuing in distinction with everybody else. The first point is that suppose you have a thermodynamic argument at the end of which you derive this beautiful equation, capital G mu nu, equals T mu. Then you have completely lost the battle because this equation is not thermodynamical, it is geometrical. So if gravity is thermodynamical, if space-time is thermodynamical, this is not the way you should think about it at all. You should have an equation which replaces it, which is completely in thermodynamic language. This is something which we have been pursuing and I will talk a little bit about it. Second, if you start or end with entropy being proportional to area, you have lost the battle. Because there is enough evidence to show that the connection between thermodynamics and gravity transcends Einstein's theory. It certainly extends to a class of theories called lankos lovelock models of gravity, where the entropy is not proportional to area. And most of our results are extendable to all these class of models. In today's talk, I'm only going to talk about GR. But uh, let it be sort of said once and for all that almost all these results are extendable to Lankos Lovelock models of gravity. Third, I belong to a very uh, old fashioned school which believes that physics is about numbers and physics is about falsifiable prediction. So, unless you can come up with a falsifiable prediction related to quantum gravity, you have again lost the value. This particular approach which we have been pursuing, first of all, gives you some structure, some more insights into classical gravity and microscopic structure, etc. But most importantly, it allows you to predict the value of the cosmological constant, which I will describe to you right at the end. It is related to the information content of the space time. Okay, so now let us get on with the details of this idea. So to begin with, this is a line familiar to all condensed matter physicists. If you look at any normal material medium, like a fluid, what distinguishes point mechanics from thermodynamics is that in thermodynamics, in addition to energy, there is also something called free energy. And the difference between the energy and free energy is essentially the heat density, that is the amount of heat per unit force. 
for most systems where chemical potential vanishes, which is what we'll be considering, this Ts is equal to P plus rho. And for a generic field described by a energy momentum tensor, if you hit it with a null vector of a particular normalization, you can reproduce this rho. And normal matter, like a bottle of water which is out there, has heat density at any point. It has a temperature at any point, it has entropy density at any point. So it has a heat density. What was discovered very early on is that this fluid called space-time also has a heat density. One can associate with every point, every event in the space-time, get T and an S, provided it is observer dependent, but given any class of observers, you can do that. And you can do that just like you can do it with a glass of water. And of course, uh, I always say this when I'm talking to another co other communities, because they all know this in the context of black hole physics, but this transcend black hole. The temperature T here depends only, it is completely independent of the theory of gravity, while the entropy density determine, depends and determines the theory. This is exactly like normal material. If I have a steel rod and a glass of water, I can keep both of them at the same temperature. Temperature doesn't tell me I'm talking about steel rod or a glass of water. But if I give you the entropy function of the material, at least the equilibrium properties of that material immediately comes down. So how does this come about? For those of you who are not familiar with it, let me just introduce that. You take any event and these are light rays going through that event. You go to the local inertial frame at that event. The light rays become 45 degree lines. And there is a region over which that lo local inertial frame is applicable. And this is the freely falling observer who is using this coordinate system. And the validity of loss of special relativity tells you how gravity affects matter here. Yeah. In addition to this guy who is freely floating, you can have another guy who is just sitting there at a given uh, fixed radius. And he will appear to be a uniformly accelerated observer in this small region. You can construct such an observer, who are called local Rindler observers. This is one of the nice contributions that Jacobson made to this field. So the Canonical uniformly accelerated observer is somebody who accelerates all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity, but you don't need that. There's a local version. And you can set up things in such a way that the vacuum fluctuations of a quantum field as seen by this freely falling observer will appear to be a thermal fluctuations to this guy who is uniformly accelerated with respect. This is a very non-trivial result, and in fact, I can probably give five lectures on this alone. So you have a temperature associated with it with a H cross over C coming in at this level. And this can happen at any point once you go to a freely falling frame and boost it to a Rindler frame, local Rindler. In fact, I believe this is probably the most beautiful result which we have at the interface of quantum theory and gravity. That observers who pursue a horizon attribute a temperature to a space time, which is given by and then if you have uh, a formula for the entropy density, which as I told you has to be related to the final theory of gravity which you have, and in Einstein's theory it is just the one quarter of the area element, you can associate a heat density with every event in space time. What is important here is that there is a feature of GR, namely regions of space time can become inaccessible to certain class of observers in any space time. This tells you that this inaccessibility of information is related in some way to the, what we usually call the entropy. So the information content of the space time has to play a crucial role when you take the next step forward. And this is what we have been saying. And as I said, there is a increasing level of recognition of this fact in the last five years or so. Now, why is this important? Why is it important that at a particular point, you have a heat density? Well, to do that, you have to go back a few centuries. If you take a, a bottle of water, in fact, I need a bottle of water. So if you take a bottle of water, then uh, we know that it is made of atoms. And these atoms are angstrom scale structures. At first, you will say that you have to perform experiments at angstrom scale to discover that water is made of atoms. That is not necessary. You can figure out that the water is made of discrete atoms without ever probing it at angstrom scale, provided you were as smart as Boltzmann. And this is exactly what Boltzmann did. 
he said that all this nonsense about calorific theory of heat and some heat fluid going from one place to another, etc., which people have been fooling around before him, he just told all of them to shut up and said, look, all matter is made of discrete structure. It's a different story that he finally ended up committing suicide. But this is what he told the world, that if you can heat something, it must have microstructure. And in fact, he gave us a formula. He said that if you have to store an energy delta E at a temperature T, you need this many degrees of freedom. Now, this is interesting because the energy and temperature are things which is known in thermodynamics. This N has absolutely no meaning in thermodynamics. N is a statistical mechanical quantity which counts the number of degrees of freedom or the atoms, as I, I will use these two phrases equally. So, if you can heat it, you have a microstructure, and of course, you can heat up the space time. So, can I have an equivalent description? Can I count the number of atoms? Something like the Avogadro number, which we count for materials, which we did even before we knew what the matter is made of. Yes, you can. Just from Einstein's equations, you can obtain the following result. If you take any space time, which is static, and if you take a region of uh, that that space-time, normal three-dimensional region, and it has a boundary. Then you can show that the gravitating energy in the bulk is just half kT times a number, dn, where dn is just the area element of the boundary divided by LP square. That is, you associate with every area element dA a number density dA upon LP square. In Einstein's theory, this has an extension to Lovelock, which is more complicated, which will reproduce the correct entropy there also. So you have a equipartition law in any static space. So let me try to introduce this somewhat through a set of diagrams. So this is the normal three-dimensional space, x, y, z, at some constant time. And think of uh, you are talking about a static uh, geometrical configuration, so you can define an equipotential surface. And uh, you associate with this two-dimensional boundary a number of surface uh, degrees of freedom, which is A upon LP square. Then you have a normal and the gravity acts in this direction and you have observers who are sitting quietly there and you have freely falling observers at every point. Comparing these two, you can associate a local temperature, which is the G local divided by Q pi. And you can also define an average temperature for this boundary, which is the average of this over the boundary. So now you imagine this two-dimensional closed boundary as some kind of a microwave oven kept at this constant temperature. Now you put matter inside. If the matter reaches equipartition with the boundary, I'm not saying it will, but if it has, then you take the total energy of the matter, gravitating energy, divided by half kT. That would be the number of bulk degrees of freedom. So far it is just definition. What one can show from this equation is that in any such configuration, the number of surface degrees of freedom is equal to the number of bulk degrees. Now, of course, this is valid in this form for static situation, but of course, we are not interested in static situation. We want to know how the geometry evolves. And in fact, there you get a much better description. This equation which describes the dynamics of space-time can be completely reinterpreted in thermodynamic language. It tells you that the heating or cooling of the space-time degrees of freedom is driven by the difference between n surface and n bulk. When they are equal, they stop. More precisely, you, this becomes very apparent if you use two different variables than your normal metric tensor. So you take this as your dynamical variable and you define another quantity which is linearly related to the Christoffel symbol. These are convenient because there is a very well-defined way, you can read this up here, very well-defined way you can show that this Q delta P and P delta Q with index suitably contracted corresponds to S delta T and T delta S of any null set. Using this, you can show that, think of this as something like uh, S delta T. So this is like the heating or cooling. More rigorously to the lead derivative of this P with product of Q. You can show that this is equal to this N surface minus N bar. So what we have here is the time evolution of the space-time reinterpreted as heating or cooling of the space-time, 
which is driven by the deviation from what I call holographic equipartition. The word holography is used in my talk in its most primitive dictionary sense. It has nothing to do with the string theory usage of that term. So this is just a surface bulk correspondence which I'm talking. So this deviation drives this heating or cooling of the equation. This equation is uh, implies and implied by the 10 equations of Einstein because this should hold for every circuit. So we have now done the first key ingredient of the paradigm that we have reinterpreted the entire geometry of Einstein's theory in terms of some kind of a heating and cooling of the space. Okay, in, in, while we are on it, I also want to uh, tell you one more interesting thing which comes out. We have introduced three constants. We introduced C right from day one, special relativity, space time, etc. H cross came in through the untrue Davis temperature. And LP square came in through the formula for the entropy density, A upon LP square. Now, the once you have these, these are the fundamental constants. The Newton's law should be written like this. This is what you would have called G, but resist the temptation to call it capital G. Because the limiting forms are very different. If you keep these two constants fixed and you let H cross goes to zero, the classical limit, this thing blows up in your face. So this is just telling you that there is no such thing as classical gravity. Gravity is all the time quantum. It is exactly like matter being all the time quantum. If you take uh, this glass of water or the plastic which it is made of, you might think that it has a classical limit. But if you read any of the standard condensed matter textbooks, you will find that you are cheating a little bit. If you take H cross going to zero strictly, every atom will collapse. We know that. So you are going to leave the H cross inside the atoms alone and you are going to do the H cross going to zero limit in the lattice dynamics in order to get the limit of the last in the real. So in the same way, when you talk about gravity or space time, this space time and matter has to come out together in some form. Both are intrinsically quantum and this is something which we will, we will keep coming across. I don't know the complete, I haven't completely figured out how this happens. But this is a good hint that this is probably the best way to think about Newton's law, not in terms of G, but in terms of LP square as a fundamental constant. Now, if this equation, as I said, has a completely thermodynamic interpretation, we also know that you can derive this from R root minus G. So there must be an equivalent thermodynamic variational principle from which you can derive this equation. This indeed can be done, and I'm not going to go into this in great detail. What you can show is that if you take uh, null surfaces and you take the entropy or heat density of gravity plus that of uh, matter on the null surface, and you maximize this thermodynamic potential for all the null surfaces, that gives you this, uh, the Einstein's equation. So you have the heat density of gravity and heat density of matter, you can guess the form of it. I will tell you a more fundamental way of looking at it in a moment. You can guess the form of it and you can write down uh, this variational principle and it works for a very wide class of gravitational theory. It is not just for Einstein's theory and as I told you, it also works for uh, uh, all the lankos lovelock kind of thing. In this approach, Gravity responds to the heat density, P plus rho, not to the energy density. And some of you would know that P plus rho is zero for a cosmological constant. So gravity does not couple to the cosmological constant. It does not couple to the vacuum energy densities, which has an equation of state, P plus rho equals zero. Any such thing just goes out of the way. However, the integration, the cosmological constant reappears as an integration constant. And as I will talk in the last part of the thing, its value is determined by a new conserved quantity for you. So this is fine. There are two further things which I want to uh, take up at this stage. One is whether we can understand this at a deeper level and whether we can get something new. I told you that you have this equation and I have now reformulated it. Very good and very nice. And somebody has said, but you haven't told us anything new. I could as well work with Einstein's theory. True. So we need to go one step further, and that is what I'm going to talk about in the next one. 
So the challenge here is that suppose you have some kind of a variational principle where there is this uh, matter thermodynamic potential and then you need some kind of a heat density of uh, gravity. How do we find the heat density of gravity from the discrete underlying structures, the atoms of space, without really knowing the full quantum theory of gravity? Because my entire approach has been top down in, uh, in length scales, not in energy scales. So you go from very large scales and you are trying to probe down. And how do we, how can we count the microscopic degrees of freedom without knowing? In order to do that, we have to somehow recognize discreteness but yet we should be able to use the normal familiar continuum mathematics because that is what we know. So how can we do that? Well, interestingly enough, we have been doing it all along, though we have, might not have thought in that line. And this happens when we talk about the atoms of a fluid. Now, if you take the normal atoms of a fluid, it turns out that it has two levels of description. So here is a fluid which is flowing with some flow lines and all that. And in the continuum fluid mechanics, if you just write down an equation for this velocity field, density field, etc., you are just attributing a single velocity at every point. At this point, the fluid has a given velocity. And then you can write down Navier-Stokes equation and uh, you can write down the conservation of mass, etc., etc., and you can solve it. Here we have completely ignored discreteness. There is no velocity dispersion at this point. There are no molecules. There are no discrete structures and the fluid just flows. But we also know that I can describe the same structure in physical kinetics using a distribution function. Now, what is a distribution function? Distribution function actually counts the number of degrees of freedom at this point. So, the distribution function comes with an extra label P. So, there is an extra attribute to that degrees of freedom. And this tells you how many atoms are here which are moving in arbitrary directions with velocities. And then you average over it to get that smooth velocity. So, in fact, if you read some good textbook like Lando's Physical Kinetics, he will tell you that this D3x here is uh, mathematically infinitesimal so that continuum calculus can be used, but physically finite so that large number of molecules can sit inside. Okay? This is exactly the idea we need. We need to have some kind of an intermediate scale where there are sufficiently large number of atoms of space so that I can use continuum mathematics and then I can count how many are there. So how do we do that? Well, in the case of a fluid, suppose I draw surfaces around it and then I keep shrinking the surface to a point. Then I can count using the, uh, using this process, I can count how many molecules are there and divide by the spatial volume and I will get the density. So this we do all the time in fluid mechanics. We don't talk like this, but essentially this is what we do in fluid mechanics. And I want to generalize this to the atoms of space. So in order to compute the distribution function for atoms of space, which will provide a microscopic origin, you need a way of discretizing it. And for that, I need a postulate, which probably will come from a full theory, quantum theory of gravity. The postulate is that space-time has a zero-point length. So let me tell you how this comes out. In order to do that, I have to introduce a concept called geodesic distance. Geodesic distance sigma square x x prime is just the distance between x and x prime in a local region where there is a unique geodesic connecting region. Now, what is not usually taught in uh, GR courses is that anything you can do with a metric, you can do with sigma square. That makes sense because metric is just one way of measuring distance. So this is called Singer's world function. And uh, one biscalar contains all the information of 10 local uh, local tensorial components. Okay, it is because it is biscalar, it can carry this information. This is how you compute sigma given GAB, and this is how you compute GAB given sigma. Therefore, so if, if somebody gives you sigma square of x comma x prime, then you know that you can compute the metric, and from metric you can compute everything else. We have reduced it to a previously solved problem. So sigma square contains the same amount of information. But sigma square is nicer to use because if you want to postulate discreteness, one simple way of doing this, which is justified by very many different arguments, is that essentially one effect of quantum gravity is to change this sigma square to sigma square plus some L naught square, or to some arbitrary function of sigma square, 
such that when sigma square goes to zero, this S of zero is fine. Everything which I am going to say will work for an arbitrary S of sigma square, but just to fix ideas, I will think of a simple Pythagorean kind of an addition. Then you can go and ask, is there an effective non-local metric, which will be divergent at a very coincident point, but a non-local metric parameterized by this L naught square, which will have this sigma square plus L naught square as the geodesic distance. That is, you are given a classical space-time like this. I am trying to find what I call a Q metric or a quantum metric, effective metric or renormalized metric. That metric will be something which will reproduce this. And that cannot be a local object. And in fact, it will diverge at every point locally. So you can do that. You can work this whole thing through. And once you have that kind of an effective metric, you can go and calculate uh, volumes of EQ geodesic surface. That is, you sit at one point and you let out geodesics of some distance sigma. That gives you a, a surface. And you can define its volume and area of that surface. In the simplest flat space context, it will go as sigma squared, both of them. And if you take the uh, curvature into account, then the volume element inside, root minus d, and the surface area element root h, is going to pick up curvature correction. This is Gauss. Okay, I mean, pretty well known in differential geometry. So there will be a curvature correction which essentially picks up this point. But in all these, if you don't put any discreteness structure, when I tend sigma go to zero, when I take the surface smaller and smaller and smaller, all these things will vanish. But if you don't do that and you put a zero point energy, a zero point length into the space time, something remarkable happens. When you go to a point, the volume still vanishes, the volume measure vanishes because this root q will have an extra sigma here. These things will all remain finite when sigma goes to zero, but this will kill it. While the area measure doesn't. So once again, we see some very peculiar thing which is happening in gravity, where areas play a very crucial role rather than the bulk volume. And you can show that to every point in this discrete space, there is a rigorous way in which you can attribute a unique area which has this epsilon c. So using this, you can go and define the number of atoms of space at a point xi, as scaling as the area measure of the EQ geodesic surface. It is not a volume measure, but area because of this peculiarity. And you can write down an expression for that. So this, you should just go up and read my papers. If you do this, everything else which we said about Rindler horizon, etc., comes up. And OK, I will skip this. And you can actually write down a variational principle whose equations of motion is equivalent to this. As I said, this is not the way to write the equation. You should write the equation in terms of thermodynamic language as heating and cooling of the space time. But this is what people are more familiar with, so I'm writing it. But it will have an arbitrary constant of integration, which is a cosmological equation. Now I want to come to that question right at the end. And what fixes the value of the cosmological constant in this approach? So what happens is that there is one more result which you can obtain from it, that the space-time becomes effectively two-dimensional in terms of spectral dimension or any other dimensional domain at Planck scale. This is something which was known for a very long time for a very many different approaches, and we have been able to show it in a reasonably model independent. As a bonus, we find that the basic unit of quantum information the minimum unit of quantum information you can hold at Planck scale is given by this number 4 pi. It essentially comes from the surface area of a two-dimensional, because it becomes two-dimensional, two-dimensional sphere of radius LP square divided by LP square, because every area has LP square division to give the quantum. So this 4 pi plays a very crucial role. Whatever is the original uh, U, the IR scale dimensions of the space-time is, when you go to the UV point, the space-time is effectively uh, behaves like two dimensions. Now let me come to the last part which I said. Recall that uh, I want to make falsifiable predictions and I want to get you numbers. This comes about in the following way. So for this, I need a rapid survey of cosmology because not all of you may be familiar with cosmology. So in the standard cosmology, if you plot the density of cosmic matter as a function of the size of the universe, you have the normal matter whose density declines like this. 
Then we also know that there is dark matter, which is some eight to 10 times more than that, and that density also drops like this. And then there is radiation, whose density drops faster because the uh, number of photons decay just like this, and but the energy of the photons get redshifted. So it has one extra power in this case like this. So the total cosmic density will sort of straddle along this curve. It was radiation dominated very, uh, very early on, and it became matter dominated at a later time. What is important for us is that this leaves a signature at this point. There is a density, a unique density, a pure number at this point, which people call rho equality in uh, cosmology, which is one characteristic number of the universe. Then, let us go a bit further. We also believe because of various evidences that the universe underwent an inflationary phase when the density was almost constant very early on. So that gives you one more number, this is rho inflation. So we have two densities describing the universe. We also know that at very late times, the density is not going down all the time, but it is sort of uh, asymptoting to the cosmological quantity, density attributed by the cosmological quantity. So there is your third number, which is rho lambda. So if you put them together, the universe is characterized by three numbers, rho inflation, rho EQ, and rho lambda. These are pure numbers, and a cosmologist who is doing physics at a redshift eight galaxy would have got exactly the same values for these three numbers, if his technology is good enough. So these are the three parameters which determine this dynamical system which we call the universe. And in fact, the Friedman universe equations can be written entirely in terms of these we also know observationally what these numbers are, but our universe looks like a very strange ad hoc piece of matter hastily put together by three arbitrary values per minute. Rho inflation, we only have a bound, but it is probably around 10 to the 15 GV. Rho EQ, we know it is of this value, and uh, rho lambda has this value. There is absolutely no relation between these two. There is no theoretical principle I, I don't consider anthropic principle as a principle. There is no theoretical principle which tells you any reason why these values should have been this or anything else. You can change all these values and there is no relation whatsoever. You can build a universe with any three values for these parameters. This strange universe of these three numbers, we really believe that two of them, rho inflation and rho EQ, which essentially is dependent on the dark matter sector and the baryons. So if we know how baryogenesis work and what is the dark matter particle from the lab, and also if we fix some kind of a grand unified scheme or whatever, high energy physics eventually should be able to tell us what is these two universes. But we have absolutely no clue in high energy physics where this rho lambda comes. So these three numbers conceptually are at very different status. Right now we may not have a theory, but at least these two numbers, we roughly know how to go about it. I mean, there may be a model in which you can explain. But no, we do not know how to do it. Now I want to, I, I call this the strange universe, but there is something stranger. I told you that there are these three numbers, rho inflation, rho lambda, and rho EQ. Let me write down this particular object all fours and 27s and 9 pi's and 3 by 2's and all. And I ask you to work this out in your calculator or in your laptop, taking for rho inflation, say 10 to the 15 GeV, and for these values which are very nicely determined by cosmology. And you compute what it is. You'll find that it is 4 pi to an accuracy of one part in 1,000. And the errors are essentially because our cosmology has to get better. And this is, of course, a weird combination. And it has a value which is 4 pi. And it is true to, it is not that it is 4 pi into, you know, 1.23 or something. I mean, it, it is accurate to one part in 1,000. Now, the question is, why is it so? You can take two points of view here. One is just a coincidence. If I spend enough time, I can come up with another combination, which is 8 pi square. Please do try. OK? But, uh, I, I think this requires an explanation, and I'll try to give you an explanation. So I had to explain the right-hand side, and I had to explain the left-hand side. The left-hand side I have already sort of indicated is the quantum of information in uh, uh, 
uh, in the quantum gravity which I motivated you because of the two dimensionality and time scale. What is this right hand side? Right hand side has a very natural interpretation. In terms of if you have inflationary phase and a cosmological constant phase and a matter radiation dominated phase, there is an interconnection between these three. The way I would write down this equation, you will find that n surface is equal to n bulk here and n surface is equal to n bulk here. But n surface is not equal to n bulk here and that is what caused this evolution. Of course, this is approximately equal because these are not pure d sitter spaces, but to a great accuracy they are equal. Using this idea, you can go and ask about the accessibility of cosmic information. By and large, you know that the information flows along the null lines, and if you go from T1 to T2, this is the distance with the light ray is going to cover. And you can ask, if I have an eternal observer, that is, he lives forever, so this upper bound I am going to put infinity, then I can write down this horizon size, so to speak, for any cosmology you have. Now, something very crucial happen whether you have lambda or no lambda. If you have no lambda and if it is sort of sensible kind of matter or radiation dominated cosmology, then this is in, it will diverge at the upper limit. If there is lambda, it is finite. So this is where the link between the cosmic information and lambda comes along. This can be made more quantitative. So here is the expansion factor versus scales, and this is the inflationary phase, radiation dominated, matter dominated, and lambda dominated. So you can plot, for example, the Hubble radius of the universe, co-moving Hubble radius, which sort of decreases during inflation, it goes up, and then comes down. Then the information flow along each of the geodesics, for example, which corresponds to x is equal to constant, is on these lines. And the edge of the visible universe, or the boundary from which you can gather information is given by this line. This is almost vertical here. It is, it is vertical to a great accuracy. So the cosmic information which I am talking about is the number of geodesics or modes which can cross this. In particular, it is the number of geodesics which will cross the inflationary phase between this point and this point. And you can compute that. I'm already off time, so let me let me not go into the details, but you can compute this number. And that number is the one which I invited you to compute. You get this combination out of it, from which you can write down this relation. The rho lambda is related to the amount of cosmic information by this formula. What is important is that if the observer can access infinite amount of information, IEC is infinity and rho lambda is zero. If IC is finite, rho lambda is finite. This is what you get. Now, if I know the value for IC, I can fix the value of rho lambda and vice versa. And I claim that the IC is ingrained into this because the co-moving Planck scale is somewhere here, and this quantum gravitational freezing of the mode is going to set this IC equals four pi, which gives you this magical relation between rho lambda, rho infinity, and rho infinity. These are three parameters which are completely independent in Einstein's theory, but they are related in this particular approach. And you get a formula, which of course is uh, correct to a great accuracy. Uh, this is a plot and, uh, okay, let me not go into this. I mean, you can put bounds and things like that. So I wanted to put this in a broader canvas, so I'll just take one more minute. Uh, let me skip this as well. This is the second part of what I call the, going to be the major discovery of the next century that we should no longer think of cosmology as a part of general relativity. The reason is the following. If you do this thermodynamic approach to cosmology, you find something very beautiful. The Friedman equations can be reduced to these two equations. The volume of the Hubble sphere increases with time because n surface is not equal to n bulk. It is just given by this equation. The second equation is that the bulk energy inside a volume, rho times the volume of the Hubble sphere, is equal to the heat density at the surface. Okay. These two equations are equivalent to the standard textbook equations of Friedman. But we know that all these thermodynamics and all these equipartition assume there is some kind of an equilibrium between underlying unknown degrees of freedom and matter. In normal material physics, we know that this breaks down in two cases. 
The one case is that when you probe things at scales comparable to the mean free path. This is like this entire description will break down if you are looking at Planck scale theory. But there is another place where this description breaks down. You are looking at very large scales, but the system hasn't had time to equilibrate. So it is away from equilibrium. And that is going to happen at the edge of the universe. So at the edge of the universe, you are going to get corrections. Why at the edge of the universe? There's something very elementary when you think about it. All the Planck scale physics is happening in the universe at very large scales, not at very small scales. Just think about it. When I go along a light ray in the backward direction, when I go further and further and further, I am probing earlier and earlier and earlier. You go sufficiently further, and if you have a non-electromagnetic probe, we can look at the sky and decide what inflation took place. And if you are still further, you can look at quantum gravitational physics at very large scales in the universe. So the cosmology is the place where you can test your ideas of quantum gravity because you are going to have the pre-Big Bang phase at a very large distance outside the horizon. And that is where these corrections are going to kick in. And because of this, we are seeing the first hints of this in this weird connection between cosmological constant and inflationary scale, which you could not have got just from Einstein. OK, so I will leave the summary just there. And uh, okay, uh, these are the references where you can read a little bit more. And these are the people with whom I have been associated with for a very long time in this work. So Mantha Chakravarti is a participant here. So is Krishna. Uh, Asim was an ex-student of TP and now at uh, Ayuka. Uh, Hamsa is right now in Zurich. And these are previous students. Thank you very much. This nice lectures and we are running short of time so we would be able to take only a couple of short questions. So, sorry, I didn't completely understand your final argument perhaps because you, you went through it fast, uh, you know, the argument about the information content being 4 pi fixing the value of the... Yeah, but, but let, let me just ask you a, a broader question which is... Uh, if, if one were to introduce this postulate, what would it say about alternative cosmologies uh, which don't even, for example, have inflation? And just to make this more precise, in string theory, there's one set of cosmologies which we think we understand very well, which is just pure anti de Sitter space, which has a cosmological constant of the opposite sign, doesn't have any inflation, and also has a tunable cosmological constant. And we believe that in those settings, we do have a, a that's perhaps the best understood theory of quantum gravity that, that, that we have. Uh, so what would be wrong with these cosmologies? Yeah, right. the, this entire theory, I didn't go into that. One of the predictions of this is that cosmological constant has to be positive. So any idea of space time is ruled. About, about the no, no, the, the, we, the, if you want to have a consistent thermodynamic interpretation in terms of n surface and n bulk, they will not be available to those model quantum theories coming from the ADS string models you are talking. Because you don't have any thermodynamic prescription there at all. Actually, there is this first law of entanglement uh, dynamics leading to Einstein's yeah. equations, which is very similar, I think. No, it is not. It's completely different for several reasons. Firstly, the entanglement entropy in at least conventional models, you can tweak it, but conventional models will always give you an entropy proportional to area. This doesn't. I emphasize that. So going after entanglement entropy, in my mind, is a wrong direction to go. Because there are consistent, huge number of results which tells you that the connection between thermodynamics and gravity transcends GR. Everything which I have told you here extends to lankos lovelock models with the corresponding entropy functional replaced by the walled entropy. And they are not proportional to area. And I do not know of a consistent entanglement argument which will reproduce that. There is a way of doing it. I mean, I know there is a way of tweaking it. But there is, it is not, it doesn't come naturally. Second, in almost all of them, it is not very clear to me uh, what entropy which I am talking about. And here, I'm not even, I have a clear separation of bulk and surface. And it is not that the surface theory is something else different. And it is not ADS safety kind of a thing where uh, gravity is mapped to something else. These are just honest to God degrees of freedom. 
So I think you asked me where is the contradiction between the models which you were familiar with and this approach. The basic thing is that there is no clear link of thermodynamic connection there. Okay, so we will take one more question and I will, I think we can hold the question. Okay. Okay. Ah. So you showed that if you have this continuum fluid type description Thanks. with some discreteness effects, then you very nicely compound the Einstein Hilbert action. So yeah, no, I didn't find Einstein Hilbert action. I find an action whose variational result will in, in match the equations of Einstein. So can you go slightly forward? Can you can you go beyond this continuum description a little bit? And right. can your approach give us insights on what should be the corrections to the Einstein okay. Hilbert action? Yes, I can do that. So this is, as I said, I'm doing top down. So as you know that if there are discrete atoms, and at one level when you ignore all of them, you throw away all the transport coefficients. So you don't have viscosity. And all these things comes because of discreteness. And you write down Euler's equation with uh, just a gradient of P as the pressure. You don't write Navier-Stokes equation. At the next level, when you take uh, the microscopic atoms of space uh, picture, you will be able to calculate these coefficients of viscosity and uh, conductivity or whatever we are familiar with for a normal fluid, the analogs of that, which will give you the corrections to the gradient of P in terms of terms, dissipative terms, like the uh, Navier-Stokes equation. So they will be the correction to Einstein's equation. Now the only place where these terms are going to be of significance is going to be at horizon scale. Not Hubble radius, horizon scale, a strict horizon scale, which is much bigger than the Hubble radius. So that is why I put that uh, sort of dot, dot, dot at the last thing. That is where the corrections are going. These corrections are all going to be suppressed by Planck line. So in any other system, I don't see any hope of seeing these corrections. So these are quantum gravitational corrections, but these are quantum gravitational corrections. You will see signatures in the sky. You will not see it uh, in any other way. So quantum gravity can be predictive if you take cosmology seriously and do this. This is work in progress, but it can be done. Okay, so I'll request you all to hold your question till the break and let's thank the speaker.